Thank you, John. I'm going to ask our colleagues to come and join me, including you, John, um, up on the stage here. Uh, I think we may have still a microphone problem to sort out for John, so we'll welcome him in a second. Um, obviously, I think a couple of interesting kind of points of view up there, hopefully some stuff to think about. Um, wherever you like, I'm not going to be particularly kind of, uh, but I think importantly, some of this stuff has high applicability to the way in which organizations have to restructure what they currently do. There are opportunities to reinvent entire business models, but there are perils to some of those things. And I think importantly, at the heart of all of this is some technology. Now, I'm going to ask Amanda to tell us a little bit about herself <laughs> on the basis that you've heard from our other two. But someone who's sit, and we were talking just beforehand, she's had a fantastic set of experiences at a variety of technology <laughs> companies. But um, please, tell us a little bit about your current role sure. and also some of the experiences and any of the observations you have about those first two speakers. Yeah, Thanks. absolutely. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. I didn't have any prepared remarks because I think I was called in last minute. I told uh, Donovan O'Neill of the CMO Council that I was in town and I travel a lot in my role for Oracle. He said, I want you at my event. I want you at Burn Finance. So that's why I'm here at the last minute. But great to be here. I thought both uh, speakers were uh, incredibly engaging, and there's so much to think about, isn't there, as marketers. My role at Oracle is I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Amir and JPAC, and uh, I also have the fun of running our inside sales development team, so that's like inside teleprospecting. My organization is about 1,000 people, so pretty significant um, commitment and investment by the company. And Oracle itself is going through a huge transformation, trying to catch up, trying to reinvent itself, uh, we're lucky enough to be number 39 on the brand list, although, to be honest, I don't feel that we're anywhere near where we should be, where we deserve to be based on the solutions we have uh, and based on the value add we can bring our customers. So when I joined, very interestingly, on the employer brand point, I think it was yourself, James, that made that point, or someone earlier, uh, when I um, was being interviewed by Oracle, it took them six months to persuade me to join. Uh, all of the people that I'd worked with previously in the startup community in London asked me why I was going to taint my brand by joining Oracle. So that's, uh, you know, that's uh, pretty damning, isn't it? Um, and the reason I did was because all of the people I met inside the company and all of the capabilities and solutions that I saw that they were bringing to market were, were in fact incredible, genuinely. I love the people, fantastic work culture uh, when you get inside, nothing like the aggressive reputation uh, that it has, one of the most um, uh, sort of biggest proponents of teleworking, for example, we were just talking about that. I worked in Silicon Valley for IBM and for Cisco, uh, and they still have a presenteeism culture in those companies. Google and Yahoo, for example, you remember Marissa Meyer saying to everybody, we've all got to be in the office. I mean, how archaic is that in this era of millennials? So I found a company that was nothing like its external reputation. And for me, of course, as a marketer, what better challenge is there right, than to try and bring all that to the outside market? So I'm on, I'm on that um, journey right now. I've been with the company for a year and a half. And literally, hot off the press, a week ago, uh, pretty much for the first time, Larry had historically been very naturally proud of the heritage of his company. Um, and one of the first questions I got asked on joining was what did I think by the, uh, uh, the uh, lady called C uh, Judy Sim, who is the corporate CMO, if you like. Uh, she asked me what I thought of the corporate brand of Oracle. And I thought, this is a career-defining moment. Uh, she just spent the holidays with Larry designing the latest series of red and white ads that were going to go on the back of The Economist. And I wasn't very impressed with them, as you can imagine. Uh, so I thought, how am I going to answer this question and still keep my job? Uh, so I answered it truthfully, which as I said, you have a fantastic brand for the company you used to be. Right? Uh, and the game has been redrawn. There are new players out there, there are new customers out there, and we have the tricky job, and now I have the tricky job, of doing the following. Jeff Bezos' his quote earlier, I quoted all the time, which is that brand for a company is like reputation for a person. Um, and if you've met someone, uh, you, you'll know, you know, we all form an opinion within seven seconds of meeting someone. So you meet someone and you decide they're arrogant, right? How many more meetings does it take to change your opinion? 21 is the scientific answer to that question. So you think of all the brand heritage and brand equity we have in Oracle around something different than what we actually are today and what we plan to be in the future, and you get a sense of the challenge. So brand is really top of my mind at Oracle. Thank you. 
Okay, and we will have some time for questions as we go, but I want to start off with a couple of points that I think are really pertinent to a number of things that are happening here, and John, I think, was sort of touching on a few of them in his topic. The ability to fail, to try things and not succeed. There is a kind of requirement almost in the digital world and have corporate permission for that. We had a wonderful time, you know, and Glad John picked HSBC as his bank up there. Uh, but one of the things at HSBC that you know I used to pedal around as the head of marketing back then was um, that uh, lovely Lord Leverhulme quote: "50 percent of what I spend on marketing is wasted. I just don't know which 50 percent." Uh, I used to try and say to my people, largely, about 15 percent of what we spend on marketing is wasted. <laughs> we know exactly which 15 percent. We're going to spend a different 15 percent and waste it next year. And there is an ability to have permission to kind of try things which is a slightly different way of saying fail. I think so just from an understanding point of view as to the sort of organizations that you've all been part of, you know, from the very agile, more creative sides of things to massive, big downstream legacy businesses to people who have to continually reinvent themselves. Perhaps I'll start with you, James. Yep. What's the Chevron culture like when it comes to failure? Because without it, I don't think you can have a proper embracing of digital. That's my point of view. Yeah. It's not good. Right. Um, the fact that I'm in my 25th year at what, Texaco and now Chevron suggests I've obviously been doing a lot of hiding. But um, <laughs> I, I think because of the, um, the way in which the majority of the focus of a downstream organization and an upstream organization is around safety, that it's kind of verboten to talk about anything else. Uh, I was in uh, head office last week, and there is a, there's a softening of this, particularly as people are understanding, as I, as I mentioned, that, you know, how important um, appealing to different customers are, having different workforces that really is okay to fail, but the, co the company's going to struggle to really put that into reality. Um, but one example that's really trying is that um, we've had a strong safety culture um, whereabouts, you know, you say, it, it tends to be a little bit of a blame culture. You know, what was the root cause of that failure? What was the root cause of that fatality or whatever it happened to be? And now that we're introducing something around called human performance, which says humans will make mistakes. And let's just make sure, make sure we connect the systems and the people up so that we put fail safes and safeguards in place so that if there is someone who fails, mm. what's the system that's going to pick that up? So the company's not really ready yet to talk about failure is okay.
And it's your job as a leader to do that, not to sit down and expect someone else will either figure it out or if you just beast everyone a bit harder, it'll all be fine. You can't do those things. Yeah, exactly. There's no guardrails for that. It goes to your point earlier on about um, what you want to do is have people who wake up in the morning and think, what are the possibilities today, rather than thinking about, you know, oh my God. And, and actually, you just need to create a culture within an organization which is led from the top, where those are the people that move far for move forward faster mm. and the one the latter ones are the ones that move forward faster out <laughs> I don't think people in our company have change fatigue I don't have initiative fatigue <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and that's the problem is, is, is initiative come initiative go and you know new thing of the moment that's what people get tired mm. about people have enough change in their own lives to recognize change is, is, is constant and needs to happen but you know, the latest initiative is what people mm. get fed up with so initiatives that stick and actually become the way forward in the culture is what, what I was trying to communicate earlier is to try and instead of having all these individual initiatives that compete with the guy in the office next door is actually to work out how these become a little bit more in, um, connected so you've actually got what's something that actually looks like a, a, a way forward. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah. yeah, so Phil McCauley, how, how can Apple recover its reputation after the extraordinary scandal of the throttling of data? Yeah. and the legal actions against it in the United States for that pernicious activity. I used to love and trust the Apple brand and I'm now considering ditching it yep. because of Tim Cook and his decision to force me to buy an alternative product so I can have quality of speed of service. Mm. I mean, I, I understand it's considered illegal what they've done in many countries. And it seems to me that he has to go. And I was wondering what you think about what they've done to themselves. Uh, well, I think there is, you know, I've worked in Silicon Valley and it's a very insular environment. You know, there was a great story recently about the Long Island Tea Company that renamed itself the Long Island Blockchain Company. I don't know if you saw that. And then their stock price rocketed, you know, went up 400%. Uh, they don't live in the real world there. And that's a great example of it, I think. They've just, they've drunk their own Kool-Aid. I mean, the, there's a scandal locally in Silicon Valley about how uh, they're not paying any taxes to the local community. And there's quite a lot of poverty, actually, <laughs> in Silicon Valley. Uh, and they don't seem to care, you know, uh, this can't carry on, you know, I was chatting with another friend of mine the other day in the startup industry and he said if anybody thinks they can have a startup now that doesn't have a social purpose at its core, then they're kidding themselves, you know, so I think they're totally missing, missing the sort of sentiment of the market right now on that. I, I agree. I, I, I think it's a real concern. Um, I don't know how they're going to uh, go about it. Um, I think that they have to do something drastic. They have, not drastic. They have to do something dramatic um, to demonstrate that um, they've made a mistake. And, um, do they need to apologise, do you think? Yeah, well, yeah, so. and, uh, and they probably need to apologise as well. I, I wonder if age but, but more important, more important is that they need to to Chris's point from earlier on, rather than um, just advertising and saying, yeah, I'm sorry, they need to do something definitive about it. I'm, I'm not qualified to answer the question, but from my take on that is, I wonder if age has got something to do with it. I get lazier and lazier about switching brands as I get older, but I think people are switching brands faster than ever, and I'd be very surprised if there wasn't some sort of backlash. You've seen yeah. a number of those technical backlash. I'm just, I'm just too lazy to do it. <laughs> but I understand my children, you know, have a, well, they won't wear a stupid right thing anymore because that's what he wore last year. I think, <laughs> great, I was hoping all the hand-me-downs would have worked for you. So. <laughs> I think that was for you. That's for <laughs> child number four. The, an the only point to add to that, I think, is that you know we've seen lots of corporate vault faces, and so maybe there's one on the way. I think you know if we're we're lucky, that's what they'll do. They'll basically have to say, awfully sorry, we got it wrong. Here's the actions we're taking to put put it right. Otherwise, they will feel the wrath of the market. Perhaps they'll buy VW. Yeah, <laughs> perhaps. Um, okay, well, I think I, I think the interesting thing with VW is that um, uh, I mean, the, people are saying that Evanley, you know, financially they're not underperforming. I'd be interesting to hear what David says, but um, the, the corollary of that is that the amount of money that they're now not investing in the future is quite staggering. So what you might see is um, Volkswagen's troubles actually coming down the line in 10, 15, 20 years' time. Okay, I've just had a signal that tells me we're out of time, so sorry if you had questions. Maybe if you wanted to, I'm sure if the panellists had some abilities to answer some things, they could. Um, in the spirit of how you're feeling, you might be feeling hungry, like my son. Um, it's lunch, so thank yes. you. So just a big, big hand to all of our guests. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so... Uh, 
thanks very much. Very, another very interesting session. Um, as Chris said, we've now got lunch outside, and I think there's probably going to be two coffee serving stations this time, so we don't end up with a big queue. Uh, if everyone could be back by 1.30, um, so we can uh, continue with the afternoon session, and possibly we'll be talking a little bit more about blockchain and possibly the Internet of Things, which hasn't had a mention yet. So uh, if everyone could be back by 1.30, that would be great. Thank you.